so as as Ishara alluded to, so I um, uh, in in February I decided to take full time study leave to work on a PhD. So that's been a big shock for me, uh, actually having to do some work on my own instead of being able to delegate it to a team, uh, which is a shame, but never mind. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is privacy and security of the Internet of Things, and particularly focus on, on how identity of things is really an important aspect. And, and I hope you find this useful. So I guess the first question we have to ask is, does it really matter? Do I care if my Fitbit data gets out on the internet, for example. You know, does it, is this important? And, and of course, Dilbert always has a take on these things, um, which, you know, he has his own unique angle on this stuff, which I always think is funny. Um, you know, uh, you have to give him more work, he's, his Fitbit says he's not stressed enough. Uh, but more importantly, this is, this is a real screenshot from 2010, uh, where people were, you could find them by googling sexual activity fitbit.com and, and identify people based on their sexual activity, uh, which you may, the, the people in the room next door to me were, were not afraid of their sexuality last night at 3am, um, which I didn't get much sleep, but, but on the whole I wouldn't really want that information advertised. Uh, sorry Isabel, I promised I wouldn't mention that, but... Um, <laughs> So, so I think I think it matters that the rules. I, I think IoT security does matter, and I and I have three basic rules: don't be stupid, be smart, and think about what's different. And what do I mean by that? Well, the, the, don't be stupid is is a lot of people seem to be remaking mistakes that uh, anyone who's been in the internet and done sort of any internet security for a website for the last ten years would think of the most dumb, basic mistakes. And people seem to be doing that anyway. And then, of course, you, you do have to be smart. So you have to take the very best available uh, systems practices that are available out there, because you know the hackers and, and people who are trying to abuse this are definitely going to be using the best available technology to try and break you. And then finally, what are the unique challenges about the IoT, what makes it different? Why is it? Why are they, why, why is this just different from ordinary web security? And I think if you consider those three things, then you, you start to to really dig into this. And in the in the thing of don't be stupid, this is a, a great example. This was in the in the press about uh, a year ago. Uh, basically, a researcher found that a fridge was sending spam out. This researcher, she. She basically contacted the IP address uh, where her spam was, that she was being spammed from, logged in on port 80, and it turned out to be a Samsung fridge, or some kind of fridge, I can't, I, I may be maligning Samsung, but you know, it had a sort of fridge-like web console. And, and it turns out they put a Linux system in here with, uh, with no security, SMTP, port 25, wide open, send mail running, and someone has taken advantage of that to send spam out. So... You know, the, the sort of most basic things about putting in a firewall, not using uh, unneeded services, had been forgotten. Um, uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is another example of Google hacking. Do we all know what Google hacking is? This is where you put in a search string, and it comes up with uh, sites that are vulnerable. And this security researcher actually found a set of houses with smart lighting systems, smart home systems in place, and, and, and he found about 80 through Google that were insecure. And out of those 80, about 30 of them, he could actually identify the house and who lived in it. And he started phoning these people up and saying, which room are you in? And they'd be like, who, who are you? What are you talking about? Which room are you in? I'm, I'm in my bedroom. And suddenly the lights would go out. Because he, you know. So, so this, is, this, is, this stuff does matter. And, and that was another example. That was actually two aspects. That was a, a default password which was installed and wasn't changed by, you know, when they installed the system, which is another classic internet security blunder. And then there's an IoT aspect to this, which is that they had, they had issued an update. And of course, when you have an update of a website uh, or something that updates automatically, it's fine. But when you have a physical system, getting people to update it is a big challenge. And that's a, a, a big challenge in IoT, is the difficulty of doing security updates. 
Just a, another example, in 1998, when I was at IBM, we were involved in some work with WebSphere, and we realized that there was an attack on session cookies. So basically, if you had a bank account, you could um, take your login and the cookie. The cookie wasn't secure enough, so you could change the last few digits of the cookie and then suddenly get someone else's bank, up account, bank account up because it wasn't checking the cookie against your credential. Uh, and, you know, here we have Mosquitoes, a, a MQTT server widely used in IoT devices, and here we have, just a few months ago, uh, them realizing the same problem exists in MQTT as it does in the web. So it's exactly the same attack, but with a different model, and, it, and Mosquito's been around for eight, nine years. So this is, this is a recent realization. So, so people are only just beginning to realize that the same things that they know about apply in this world, unfortunately. So there's a bit of a face plant moment here going on. So, um, and, then, and then we have, well, what's different about IoT? Well, a lot of it's to do with those things I've mentioned already. Updates are harder. There's a lot of aspects to do with the capabilities and the challenges of, of small devices. So there's a lot of power aspects. Uh, encryption is very difficult on small devices. Um, the typically people choose options that, that require very low power or low cost, which may preclude security. There's also a lot of, to do with just usability. So Fitbit uh, made some choices about how you, how you sign up your, your Fitbit that were around usability. They wanted to make it as easy as possible, and, and some of those things have challenges around security. So, for example, Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth 4, uh, they, they use well-defined, well-understood AES-256 bit encryption uh, on, on Bluetooth, so that's secure. Unfortunately, they invented their own protocol for, for key exchange to make it simpler and easier, and they blew that, and there's a big hole in that. And so, unfortunately, if you're sitting there when two Bluetooth devices uh, meet for the first time, then you get the keys, and then all that AES encryption is completely pointless. Uh, they have fixed that in the latest Bluetooth standard, but because it's a hardware thing, it's going to take at least four years, five years before all those old devices are gone. The data is often really personal here. Um, and, and I think that's a, a big challenge for people because you know, we're, we're increasingly in, encroaching on the privacy of people, and not just through data, but through metadata. We all know the challenges of, of what can be done through de-anonymizing metadata. Um, and if you don't, then you should find out, because I think that's a, that's a, a big challenge for the, for the internet for the next 10 years. And, of course, appliance manufacturers have not got used to the fact that they're living in this internet security world. They haven't got used to this at all. So, for example, if you buy a Tesla, it's a beautiful car, it's fantastic, it's got an uh, Ethernet port in it, you plug in, you get full access to the bus. Uh, you might think, well, I hope so. that's okay, I'm safe, I don't have a Tesla. But actually, every single car sold in Europe for the last 10 years has an OBD2 port on it. And in many of those cases, you can cause serious uh, consequences by messing with that OBD2 port. Uh, for example, you can apply the brakes or the accelerator by sending messages over that port. So if you physically put that device in there, you have problems. Uh, anyone got a BMW? If you have a BMW, there's a great video online from a researcher at Birmingham University who shows how in 360 seconds he can start your car. They did it to him already. Excellent. So yeah, so if you've got a BMW, if they get inside and they can physically put a RFID card reader anywhere near to the dashboard, they can start your car and drive it away in 360 seconds. Um, so people are not really treating this as seriously as they should, I think. Uh, and a lot about it is physical hacks. So those same researchers who hacked the, the, um, the, the BMW also hacked the Oyster card. Uh, they didn't hack it because they wanted to travel on the London Underground free. They hacked it because there was a university in the Netherlands which used this as the security to the entrances to all the buildings. And so when the university put this in place, they thought, well, let's look at if it's, it's secure. Um, it turns out it was also being used to guard all the nuclear power stations in the Netherlands. 
And the day after they announced this, there were, uh, the army was mobilized to guard every door in every nuclear power station, every military establishment in, in the Netherlands because of this insecurity. Um, and what, what the makers of the Oyster card probably weren't imagining was that somebody would take the time to look at their chip under a scanning electron microscope, reverse engineer the algorithms, and then find flaws in those algorithms. But they did. Um, if you can't be bothered to do that kind of stuff yourself, there are companies on the web who advertise their services who have their own scanning electron microscopes and you send them hardware and they'll hack it for you. This company does that. Um, or you can try it at home if you want. Uh, this is basically how to uh, try and break the uh, code storage uh, bit that doesn't that stops you from reading the code on common microchips that are used in many IoT devices. Um, and there's a very good report from the University of Cambridge, about 60 pages, about many different hardware attacks that are available. So one of the most important recommendations, and my first recommendation for hardware, is don't rely on obscurity. So that's what the Oyster Card guys did, was to rely on the obscurity of this hardware. But people are, are willing to break that obscurity. And, and that's also my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth recommendation as well. And, and really a corollary of that, the most important thing that you have to do, and I think this isn't always clear to people, is that unlocking a single device should only unlock that device's data. So if any of you are Xbox users, you probably know that the original Xbox had an encryption key on it, it got broken, and then all Xboxes were broken. They were all rooted out of that encryption key. And, of course, that's a common thing because it's very hard to manufacture uh, so every Xbox is different. That that's adds hugely to the cost of manufacturing, but if you want to be secure, you have to, you have to do those kind of things. So this is one of the challenges that we have, which is a cost versus security uh, aspect. Uh, here's a sort of overall table. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is basically analyzing the, the classic... Uh, security characteristics and saying what's different in the IoT world and what's particularly different in the IoT world is that we have to consider these different layers. We have to consider the device and the hardware, the network and then the cloud or the server side. Uh, and of course some of these things are just you know, as normal as usual but then there are many new challenges when you look at this matrix. So uh, I think one of the problem statements we have here is that a lot of people who are building IoT devices don't really believe in this top statement, that consumers, not companies, own the data. So the, this is a really important question. Is who, who owns the data from your Fitbit? Is it you or is it Fitbit? Who owns the data from the Uber app on your phone? Is it you or is it Uber? So I, I think this is, a, this is actually quite a challenging statement from, from Limor Fried. Uh, and, I, and, and this is not at all the current belief amongst the industry at all, but I think it's a, it's a very challenging, important way to look at it. And, and then a second statement is from, from a professor called Kavukian in, in Canada, and, and she has led a thing called Privacy by Design. And this is really what, if you were in the Identity Server talk this morning, uh, and Johan was talking about the, the new standard called UMA, user manage access. This is really what user manage access is trying to do. OAuth 2 is also doing this, but to a lesser extent, and OpenID Connect. But basically trying to say, your controls should be in your hands. So it should be up to you to define how, uh, these, how this data is shared, how it's used, and so forth. And unfortunately, that is also not the case in many, many aspects. And I, and I think that word effective is really important. Because this is actually really challenging. How do you, how do you give your, your mother or your father uh, or your brother, who may not be as technically savvy as you, how do you give them controls over their data so they really understand this and know how to use this? So, you know, the, the, there's lots of studies, for example, that show that, you know, when people put their, you know, when they install an Android app on their phone and it pops up that list of, things this app can do, they don't ever look at it to see whether it's, it's valid or not. Why does this flashlight need to make calls on my behalf is not a question that goes through their head. 
Um, and so effective controls is really hard. This is a, this is a really challenging area of, of user design. So what is this privacy by design concept? And I, I don't completely agree with all of these these points, these seven points from the, from the privacy to, by design movement, but I, I think the concept it, on the whole is really important. So the, the first and most important thing is that most of the IoT security I've seen has been reactive. You know, people have been uh, solving problems when they come up, and I believe that we're going to see over the next six to 12 months a lot more of these Fitbit type scandals coming out because uh, there is a huge untapped mine of, of possible hacking to be done there. And, and that's because people are, are being reactive. They have not proactively thought about security enough in the design of their systems. Uh, the second idea is that privacy should be the default setting. So the default setting should be, if you want to share data, you have to actively say, I want to share this data. It shouldn't just be shared like the Fitbit. One. So that was a perfect example of this. Uh, they were putting up information that users probably didn't want by default, and then you had to switch it off. Uh, and then how do you achieve that? Well, you embed the privacy into the design. So you start thinking about it from day one. Um, this next one is kind of challenging. This is so, trying saying that, that somehow you do all this and you can be just as functional and just as powerful as if you don't do that. And I, I don't really believe that. I think there's always a trade-off with security. There's either a cost trade-off or a usability trade-off or something. I mean, we never have pure 100% secure answers here. We are always trying to get some balance. Uh, and that, that's a really important thing to bear in mind. I mean, if you force a user to memorize a you know 64 character password with lots of different random strings in it that has no fragments that can be found in a dictionary, you might think that's going to be more secure. But of course it's not going to be more secure. They're going to write it down on a bit of paper. Uh, and so uh, and they're going to have that bit of paper out for about five minutes while they try and type this in effectively on view. You know, so, so security is a balancing act. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a, a pure yes or no answer. But I think trying to aim for this is a good thing. Uh, certainly, end-to-end -end security is really important. Uh, not just protecting the Fitbit when you're in the vicinity of the Fitbit, but protecting your data when it's on the web. Uh, and what's the life of that data over the next 20 years? How do I know what's happening to that data in the future? Of course, at WSO2, we massively believe in openness, and, and we've published you know, open promises not just about our software, but about the, the data that we use in the cloud and, and our cloud systems. And visibility and transparency is absolutely vital to this. You can't, you know, if you're not transparent about your privacy, how do you know what's happening? And, and finally, this concept of keeping it user-centric. So I think these are all good principles uh, to some less or greater extent. So if you've been following this, Google announced at their I.O. developer conference about five days ago that they are jumping into the Internet of Things and are going to be uh, producing an IoT operating system uh, called Brillo, um, which is basically a very cut-down version of Android. And they've announced a new... It's not clear whether it's a protocol or a schema or, a, or some combination of the two called Weave. Uh, they didn't mention security at all in their, in their announcement. So I don't know whether they've applied any privacy or design or not, but they're certainly not being open and transparent yet. We'll see, we'll see how they come out in the future. This is still early days. But I think, you know, I have certainly seen, you know, there's a lot of IoT standards out there, a lot of people, Thread and AllJoin and all sorts, uh, coming out with new security models and new IoT standards, and, and a lot of them are thinking at certain parts of the stack. So they may be thinking, how do I secure the wire protocol? How do I encrypt this? But I don't see a lot of people really trying to pr provide that end-to-end -end privacy by design thinking across the whole stack. And there's a saying that I learned from Prabath. It's, it's been common in the security industry for about uh, three or four years now, that identity is the new perimeter. And this is absolutely vital in the IoT world. So a lot of security in the past relied on perimeters. 
on the fact you could only access the system from a computer inside, the, inside a company building, or only on a VPN, uh, or, or only within a firewall. And unfortunately, those, those truths are no longer true. And the IoT basically extends that perimeter to be almost infinite. So this is a fractal, and you might think that there's a bound to that edge, the, the, the boundary between the black and the, and the blue. You might think, well, it's, I, can see the, I can see the extent of it. It must be, it must be finite, but in fact, it's an infinite boundary um, because the more you zoom in, the, the more it expands. And, and effectively, with the IoT, you know, with 20 billion devices predicted by, by 2020, and that's a conservative estimate, 50 billion by about 2030, you know, this perimeter is becoming infinite. And so you cannot just do this by saying, I'm only going to... I'm only going to secure stuff within a boundary. And, and, and frankly, it's a bad approach anyway. You know, if you have a VPN, you may think it's secure, but as soon as someone's in that VPN, they have all the goodies. This is, this is why, you know, why there's a, some poor private in the US jail for 25 years, uh, because he was given access to every single secure document that was available. This is why Snowden managed to, to, to cause so much harm to the NSA, because... He was inside the perimeter, and he had full access to everything. So fundamentally, it's a wrong attitude anyway. I actually, I'm actually pro-Snowden, but you know, if you think about it from a security point of view, they, they blew it. So identity is really important because you're saying, I'm going to try and apply the security rules based on who you are or who this device is, not on its location, not on its IP address, not on a VPN, not on its in or out of some, some perimeter, but actually on this device. So what does that mean? If you're going to do that, you need to have a very strong and competent concept of what the identity is. So we need some requirements for those identities if we're going to do this. And I think the first one that I think is important is that it needs to be federated. So it needs to be based on your choice of provider, not on the... the the devices provider. And that is not the case today. But uh, my fundamental belief is that you, you only trust people when there's a choice. Uh, you, you need to be able to choose someone more secure and then that uh, creates a competition around security. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't completely true. There isn't really a, a provider of email, for example, who is really secure. If you really want a secure email system, you pretty much have to run it yourself. Um, so, and there is no one you can pay $10 a month for a secure email. So, so there isn't really, that, that choice hasn't got through to the masses yet. But I do think it's a fundamental point of this. Secondly, of course, it has to be scalable. It has to be able to cope with billions of devices. We already talked about user managed. So is this in your control or is this in someone else's control? And of course, we would like it to be uh, secure in the sense that no one's cracked it yet. Uh, unfortunately, that's actually that's that's harder than it sounds. When you look at standards as a as an everyday person, you think, well, yes, either they're broken or they're not. Uh, that isn't actually the truth. When you actually start reading security research, you find that a lot of things that we use every day are broken. A lot of the encryption protocols we use are broken. A lot of so forth. Uh, and breaking it is is actually a grey area. So maybe that somebody can break it with you know, millions of hours of computing time uh, and the right access and so forth, but it's impractical. This, is, this comes back to what I'm saying about it being a gray area. You know, security is a cost analysis. Is it, is it secure enough for what I'm doing? Uh, and unfortunately, that's, a, that's something that we have to apply to this. And, and I think what we haven't really realized is that the way we are expanding access to the data about the real world is... Uh, opening up more attacks than we imagined. So, for example, if I know your location, uh, it, it might make it a lot easier for me to burgle your house because I know you're not there. Uh, and, that, and that's already been used with Facebook. People have uh, publicly you know, had their Facebook page wide open and the criminals have said, spotted someone going on holiday, and then they've gone and help themselves to their possessions. So uh, I think the IoT is opening up new areas and, and maybe we haven't quite understood 
what the challenge is and, and the cost-benefit analysis we need to apply to security. So identity definitely shouldn't be based around passwords. So passwords suck. So who, who likes it when you get asked to enter a new password and sign up onto a new site? Yeah, no, I don't either. Uh, I mean, you're left with, what are the choices you're left with? You can either break the terms of service and use a password you've already used before, right? And, and open yourself up to being, to, to insecurity, which you know, right? That's not fun. But on the other hand, I can't remember a new password. How am I going to, am I going to come up with a new password and remember it? And by the way, oh yeah, I, I try 18 things before it gets to one that it'll accept. Um, so, you know, passwords suck. They suck badly, but they suck even more for devices. Passwords are not designed for devices. The whole idea of a password is you remember it in here. And the only place it's accessible is in your brain. And luckily, so far, although they, they're getting pretty good with being able to read our brains, they can't yet read a password out of our brain. Um, but you can, as I said before, uh, take a bit of hardware and attack it in a number of ways to try and get at that password. So there are some standards that try and solve this. And, and the ones that we at WSO2 have been using and, and working on for a while are OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. And uh, some of you are in the telco industry will know we uh, had the world's first production um, uh, OpenID Connect a system for mobile phones, a, a, a part of mobile, OpenID Connect called Mobile Connect from the GSMA uh, that we launched in Sri Lanka last year, uh, and we've won some awards for that work. And, and basically the concept here is it works on a token model. And the best example, the best analogy for this I've come across is one I stole from Tim Bray. Uh, he's one of the XML founders. Uh, and, a, and a very, very nice guy and a, and a very deep thinker. And, and he had this concept, is just like the token you get from the hotel. So why is that, what, what is the point of this token? Well, the idea is that it's revocable. So if you lose that token, uh, you don't, you, you know, no one can get in your room. You go to the front desk and say, hey, I lost my, t my token, and they revoke it. It has some time bounds. So, you know, I, my stay at this hotel ended today, and if I try to use my key now to get into the room, it won't work because it's after the checkout time. Um, it has granular access. I can only get into room 532 with this card. I can't get into room 531 or 533. Um, so, so these are all important aspects of tokens that make them much, much better than passwords, and particularly for devices. Because the way you need to think about a device is that I am... I'm the owner of this data, I'm the owner of this system, and I am giving it some permission to do what I want on my behalf. I'm giving it permission to collect my activity, or to let me into my house, or to change the heating, or do things that I would normally do, but I'm giving it permission to do those on my behalf, and that's exactly what tokens are about. So... This can basically give a meaningful consent mechanism for sharing data. And it's, it's much, you know, those revocable, granular concepts, time-based, are much, much better for the device. And it's relevant both for the device talking to the cloud and also then how we then share that data onwards in the cloud. And so I've been doing some work, uh, some, something I published uh, about 18 months ago about how to use... Uh, OAuth 2 with IoT devices, uh, and there's some other researchers as well working in this space. A really important aspect of the OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect standards is this thing called dynamic client registration. Uh, and it sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? But basically what this is is the standard that allows you to embed a different set of credentials into every device. So this is, I'm not saying this is easy because you have to change your manufacturing process to actually do something to every single device as they're manufactured, or you have to have a, a, a setup stage with the, when, when somebody buys this device and registers it, which does this. But basically, it's a RESTful standard that allows you to get new credentials on behalf of a device at runtime. So why does this matter? Well, I, I love this slide. I use it every single keynote I do, and, and I, 
And I felt it was important here. And, and one of the reasons this is really important is because the, the world we have is changing. And, and you know, we saw those adverts. We've been having talks about connected business. We all know this. The connections are getting deeper and wider in, in the web world all the time. And this, this really charts the shift we've had in organizations from uh, organizations doing everything themselves to value webs, to basically ecosystems of, of communities and companies working together to solve problems. And I, I don't feel we're really there with the IoT yet. So in the web API world, uh, and we see this with WSO2 API Manager with lots of companies, we see companies that have rich ecosystems of APIs, where I talk to an API at a company and they give me back a FedEx tracking thing. I can talk to FedEx's API. They may be using FedEx's API and a payment API. There's a, a rich set of ecosystems of different APIs working together to solve a single business problem. At the moment, most devices are really only talking to the mothership. You know, my Fitbit's talking to my Fitbit server, my Nest is talking to Google. You know, they're just talking to the mothership. And I, and I don't think that that's the right answer. Firstly, it's limiting. Uh, we're not getting the richness of IoT that, we're going, that we can imagine. But secondly, uh, it, it ties me to that mothership in an unacceptable way. I want to federate that so that I get access to my own data and I'm more in control of it. This is an IoT device that was launched in London. It's a London company a, a, few years, a couple of years ago called Little Printer. It's a delightful web-connected printer that lives in your home. and It's really sweet. You're, you can leave it on your kitchen table and you can send a little printed out message to your wife or kids or whatever. Delightful. Well, goodbye, Little Printer. Hello, Little Brick. Because, unfortunately, it didn't work. And this, the company behind the device has gone out of business. Um, they announced this about six months ago and they said that you know, as of March, uh, your little printer would be no longer that useful. Uh, the CEO actually is, is a pretty nice guy and he's got another job and he's spending his weekends trying to fix this and his personal time to get them some really basic functionality so their devices aren't completely dead. He managed to scrounge a couple of uh, K from some, some friends so that he could keep the servers running for another couple of months while he hack this up, but fundamentally, you know, you're, that's, that's his goodwill and, and the fact he's a nice guy and he feels bad about this. But the reality is that a lot of these devices, you're going to be reliant on the, on the cloud service for these devices because they're not federated. There's no, there's no standards for, for how they talk to the back end. It's a private relationship between this device and the mothership. And... Uh, that's bad from the point of view of usability, but think about it from the point of view of privacy. Right? Should your privacy be reliant on, the, on this manufacturer? Hands up who's a Lenovo user. Any Lenovo users? Well, you know that the, um, that the privacy of your device should not be reliant on the manufacturer, don't you? Because you had a, about a week of hell... Uh, three months ago when it turned out that all the Lenovo machines had malware on them uh, and uh, all their HTTPS connections that had been insecure for the last six months or whatever it was. Uh, this was in the papers yesterday that the British police are jealous of Uber. Our most senior police officer uh, basically started moaning about the fact that Uber can track you better than they can. He, he made it sound very, very nice. You know, he's like, you know, when, when the 999 call comes in and you're in an emergency, we don't know where you are. He didn't mention that, you know, all the other times he'd like to use this. But, uh, but it turns out that Uber has this thing called the God View. So has anyone heard of the God View from Uber? And, and their, their employees were using this to track ex-girlfriends and all kinds of things and potential girlfriends basically follow you around San Francisco or whichever city you're in based on your Uber app. And, and they can do this to anyone. They just type your email address in and bingo, they know where you are. So yes, I think it's a good thing that the, that the police don't have that power 
And fundamentally, uh, I, I've deleted the Uber app off my phone because I don't want Uber to have it either. Um, so I want to leave you with this thought. You know, I've been a bit... I'm not trying to be negative here. You know, it's very easy to stand up here and, and say there are all these problems, there are all these hacks, there are all these attacks. This is terrible. And, and security researchers do this every new technology that comes out. You know, when the cloud came out, we've had, you know, lots of, oh, you can't trust the cloud, it's not secure. When client server came out, I know we had, you know, I was doing early client server stuff in IBM. We had people saying it's not as secure as a mainframe, we can't allow it. When the web came out, we had, you know, all, so it's very, it's very easy to sit there and say we shouldn't do this. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that we need to think about how, how we can mitigate these things and get the right balance between security and insecurity. How we can get the right balance between cost and, and difficulty and usability, but at the same time give users the privacy that they deserve. And if you're building IoT apps, you, I want you to think long term. I want you to think in 10 years time, when this is taken off and, and suddenly all this data is there, now what's happening? You know, when Uber was a, a, a small company with one city, uh, probably the God view seemed like a fun thing to the developers. When it's multiple cities and millions and millions of users, it suddenly no longer becomes such a fun thing and it starts to become a, 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 an embarrassment to the company, but also a real challenge to, to the legality of what they're doing. And... I want to leave you with this idea of an exemplar. You know, we are all building good stuff here. We are all building the latest, best connected world applications and so forth. And I think that we have a duty to uh, try and share that and try and come up with the best available concepts of how to provide privacy and security for IoT. You know, we need to be the people that are creating the rules for IoT security that are going to last us the next 10 years. And I, and I think that that's going to be how we solve this, by working as a community in open source, in open standards, uh, and in, in other forums for basically saying, well, what is the best way of doing this? So I, I want to leave you with a positive message. There is something we can all do about this, because you're all smart guys who are all involved in creating the connected world. And I think we have the opportunity to actually do something good here. So I'm going to leave you with one last thing. This is a, uh, a saying. Has anyone heard this saying on the internet? No one knows you, nobody knows your dog. Came from a New Yorker cartoon. Well, of course, now they have internet-connected dog collars. So I'll leave you with a new quote. On the internet of things, no one knows your dog collar. Um, sorry, it seems to have got lost on the side of the webpage, but never mind. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>